Let us pray. Holy God, as we draw near to your word, draw near to us. Send your Holy Spirit. Empower us to have open ears, open hearts, open minds. Abide with us this day. May we hear your truth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from 1 Kings 19, verses 4 through 8. For a bit of context, the prophet Elijah has just enjoyed a major success at Mount Carmel, during which he challenged the followers of Baal to a contest involving fire on an altar. He proved that the God of Abraham was the true God and triumphed over the prophets of Baal. But this angered Jezebel the queen, and she wanted to kill Elijah. So he got up and fled for his life. And it is in this flight from the queen that we meet Elijah today in the wilderness. Hear now God's word. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights, to Horeb, the mountain of God. Our gospel reading for today comes once again from Jesus' Bread of Life discourse in John chapter 6. When reading this text, it may feel like deja vu because we've been talking about bread for weeks now. It's interesting that those who created the lectionary we follow decided to dig into this passage for five whole weeks here in the season following Pentecost. Some preachers have lamented about the challenge of extracting five sermons from a few paragraphs about bread. Others have joked that this carb loading is unhealthy. (laughs) Others, like Pastor Mike so wisely stated in our worship planning meeting this week, believe that spending this kind of time with a text allows us to examine it with more depth and integrity, like considering a cut diamond from its many sides. And so, with our ears open, eyes open for a fresh bake, I mean take, on Jesus' words, hear now from John 6, 35 and 41 through 51. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, And they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that now comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I recently passed my three-year anniversary here at Forth, and so I've been reflecting on our spiritual journey together, remembering moments of joy and celebration and the seasons of change and challenge. Someone recently asked me, 
when did you know that you were called to serve forth? And I jokingly replied, I think it was about the time the search committee served me creme brulee at the Poinsett Club. (laughs) As I continued to think about it, maybe that isn't as much of a joke as I originally thought. You see, when I reflect on that weekend in the spring of 2018 when Jeremy and I came to visit, I remember the way my taste buds tingled with delight, not only at the creme brulee, but with the perfect little biscuits and homemade Polly's Island Derby pie that Lynn Mitchell lovingly prepared. I also remember the scent of the sanctuary when I first walked through these doors, the smell of wooden pews and well-loved hymnals, I remember seeing the light beaming through the stained glass windows and tears gathered in the corners of my eyes. I remember touching this pulpit and feeling where other hands have rested over years of faithful proclamation. I remember smelling the jasmine in the memorial garden as I learned about the saints who rest there. I remember the laughter around the dinner table and the warm embraces as we departed. And I remember feeling the Holy Spirit's nudge, which for me comes in the form of my heart leaping. As I reflect on these first memories of visiting forth and sensing God's call, I'm struck by how physical these memories are. They're stored in my body through my senses. This is a big deal for someone like me because I spend most of my days trapped in my mind. For those of you who are familiar with the Enneagram, I'm a type five, the investigator. We are by nature highly cerebral overthinkers. My two undergraduate majors were religious thought and philosophy and psychology. (laughs) I can analyze, research, and evaluate for hours and hours on end. Just ask Jeremy. (laughs) But here's the thing. When I need to experience God's presence or discern God's will, I can't just think and study on it. I've got to experience it in my bones, in my muscles, in my senses. It's got to be an embodied experience, not simply a thought. We live in a post-enlightenment world where thought and reason rule the day. And in some ways, this is a gift. We question and wonder. We critique and refine. We diagnose and solve. And in many ways, our world and even our faith are better for it. Our ability to learn and teach is something we Presbyterians in particular value. Our biblical studies are richer because of the various forms of biblical criticism we apply. And our theology is healthier because we wrestle with deep questions and expand our understanding as God reveals God's self in new ways. And while we certainly do find God at work in these brilliant minds that God created, we are more than our minds. We are creatures, fashioned in the image of God, a God who became incarnate and dwelled among us in the flesh, a God who experienced hunger, thirst, joy, sorrow, peace, and pain. We experience God's world through these bodies, these miraculous, imperfect bodies that can touch and taste and see and smell and hear. And while many of us lament our body's limitations or imperfections, all bodies are good and valuable. There are different currents of belief in Christianity about bodies. Some would say that our bodies are just temporary vessels for our souls, earthly shells that don't matter much in the long run. But if you talk to someone who has lost a person they love, they might disagree. While we trust that a person's soul is indeed safe with God forever, we grieve for the touch of a hand and the sound of a voice. Others would say that our bodies are pesky hindrances that trip us up in our relationship with God. Paul laments of the thorn in his flesh and warns of the temptations of the body. Anyone who has endured health challenges or addictions might resonate with this view. Some bend in the opposite direction and spend all of their time focused on physical action, feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, marching with the oppressed. They may not give much thought to spiritual exploration or theological discourse, After all, what good are those things if people are suffering? 
we can find Bible verses to support all of these different approaches. But today's scripture from 1 Kings and from the Gospel of John give us a more expansive view. In Elijah's wilderness story, we see a person who is on the cusp of giving up. He says, I've had enough. Just let me die here already. And just when he thinks he's at the end of his rope in the hot desert, he finds shade under a solitary tree and falls asleep. An angel wakes him and tells him to eat. And to his surprise, there was in front of him a cake baked on hot stones and some water. He ate and drank and slept some more. He awoke again to an angel telling him to eat and drink so that he could have strength for the journey. And sustained by that food and drink, he traveled 40 days to Horeb, the Mount of God. I've heard it said that this story is a perfect reminder to never underestimate the spiritual power of a snack and a nap. (laughs) Elijah was a man with answers. He had proven to know God. As a prophet, he advised others on God's will. But in his moment of need, he needed more than just answers about God. His body needed rest. He needed to feel the shade on his back and to taste the bread on his lips. And God responded to those needs with care, with tangible gifts of grace and strength, gifts that were good for body and soul together. When we look at today's passage from the sixth chapter of John about Jesus' claim to be the bread of life, it's tempting to think of this only as a metaphor. Just as bread brings life to the body, so Jesus enlivens us. But let's not forget how this chapter began with a literal meal, five loaves of bread and two fish shared with 5,000 people. The good news of the gospel for people who are physically hungry is not a metaphor about bread. It's literal bread. Jesus knew that bodies matter, and he fashioned his ministry on earth around tending to both physical and spiritual needs. And I think more often than we realize, those needs are one and the same. When I served as a hospital chaplain, I learned that when someone was in deep spiritual or emotional crisis, It was important to bring them water and food. It was important to find a place for them to nap. And time and time again, I marveled at how a single act of caring for their bodies would give way to transformative conversations about God. The air in the room would grow thick with divine possibility, and the distance between heaven and earth would disappear. And I think that's why so much of our worship involves our bodies, We stand, we sit, we bow, we speak, we sing, we listen, we laugh, we touch, we eat and drink at table in communion with God. We feel the water on our heads at baptism. A few weeks ago, we even danced in worship and did the hokey pokey. (laughs) Worship happens outside of this sanctuary, too. I've heard it said that every time we touch water, Whether it be washing the dishes, taking a drink, or washing our hands, it's an opportunity to remember our baptism. And every time we eat, it's an opportunity to remember the bread of life that meets us at the table of grace. With this lens, every time we touch, taste, see, smell, or hear, we can further awaken to our connection with the one who breathed life into our bodies. Barbara Brown Taylor wrote in her book, An Altar in the World, to make bread, to dig in the earth, to feed an animal or cook for a stranger. These activities require no extensive commentary, no lucid theology. All they require is someone willing to bend, reach, chop, stir. Most of these tasks are so full of pleasure that there is no need to complicate things by calling them holy. And yet, these are the same activities that change lives, sometimes all at once and sometimes more slowly, the way dripping water changes a stone. In a world where faith is often construed as a way of thinking, bodily practices remind the willing that faith is a way of life. She also writes, Earth is so thick with divine possibility that it is a wonder we can walk anywhere 
without cracking our shins on altars. I think this is the abundant life to which Jesus invites us, one in which the divide between sacred and secular, body and spirit, is erased. An embodied life in which we embrace our humanity, our creatureliness, and recognize that Christ's incarnation, becoming God with us, was not so that we could escape our world, not so that we could transcend our pain and suffering that we experience in our bodies, but so that we could experience the fullness of God in mind, body, and spirit. I know that many of you worshiping with us today understand the realities of experiencing pain or suffering in your bodies. And even if that isn't your present reality, one day it will be. And I know we all feel humanity's pain under the weight of COVID-19, a disease that wreaks havoc on bodies. I don't claim to understand why pain and suffering exist. And I don't know how to make it go away. But I do know this to be true, something Plato once said, pain restores order to the soul. To be in pain is to be present in the body, to be real, to be human. And from that place of realness, of humanness, our pain can catalyze the process of spiritual growth and union with God. Rumi once wrote, the throbbing vein will take you further than any thinking. Seasons of suffering show us what is real, show us who we really are, and show us how near God can be in body and in spirit. Let us take heart in knowing that Christ meets us in our present reality, in our bodies, and transforms pain into beauty, into union with God. That is what it means to partake of the bread of life. And if you find that your pain these days is less physical and more spiritual in nature, if your deep questions keep you up at night and your worries grow beyond yourself, if you spend your time like Elijah looking up to heaven with exasperation and defeat, don't underestimate the power of reconnecting with your body, of eating nourishing meals and drinking water, of getting good sleep, of moving your body, of sitting in the sun, These, too, are spiritual practices. These, too, are means of God's grace. To close, I'd like to invite you all to join me in an an embodied prayer. So get comfortable in your seat. I invite you to place your hands on your heart and close your eyes. Take a breath. As you continue to breathe, feel the coolness of the air as it enters your lungs. Feel its warmth as it returns to the earth. Remember that the same Spirit of God that hovered over the face of the deep in the beginning of time breathes into you and gives you life. Feel the warmth of your hand on your heart. Consider your heart space as you breathe, imagining the breath of God flowing into your heart. Christ within me, Christ behind me and before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in the hearts of all who know me, Christ in the mouth of friend and stranger, Christ in quiet and in roar. Love, blessed trinity of three, bound in unity who guides my journey. I will arise with strength of heaven, trusting in your light to guide my journey. Shine before me, lead me home. Power to guide me, might to hold me. Wisdom, teach me, watching over me, ear to hear me, hand to guard me, love to conquer every fear. Amen.